All right. Thanks for staying put in the place. Go ahead. Hit your share button. I bring you an interview uh, unlike any other interview that I ever brought to you. This is going to be very, very illuminating. Please hit your share button. Hit your share button. Let's get at least, at least 700 people before I bring you that interview. And yes, I said the name of the app is ABC Amber TV. Go to Play Store. You go to Play Store and you search for ABC Amber TV. It's not one word, three separate words. ABC Amber and then TV. Those are the search terms that you want to put in there. Now, uh, a lot has been going on out there uh, in the struggle, ladies and gentlemen. I'm sure many of you read the interview put out there, published yesterday or today, today, uh, by uh, the Canadian High Commissioner, the Canadian High Commissioner in La Republic du Cameroon. Uh, I thought I would be able to come to you with some commentary on that interview with others, including that of Tabo Nash. Ta uh, yeah, is it Tabo? Yeah, I think Tabo, is it Tabo Nash. Yeah, I think so. Uh, including his own, but uh, because this interview that I am bringing to you is a little bit uh, lengthy, I would prefer to come to you with that special broadcast uh, within the week. If it is not tomorrow, it will be Thursday. But uh, of course, you see me, you know that uh, I'm coming for uh, a very uh, special presentation. Ladies and gentlemen, you are not hitting your share button. You go ahead, hit your share button as I bring you this interview with uh, Professor Hussein uh, Bohan, who is one of the statesmen, one of the statesmen in Somaliland, one of those who live in the diaspora, then later return to Somaliland to fight for homeland, to fight for independence for Somaliland. And Bazonia has lots and lots of similarities. In fact, it's like the same picture, the same picture that we find in Somaliland, we find in Ambazonia. That is why after listening to Professor Hussein uh, Bohan in the recent conference that uh, we attended, I thought to bring him to ABC to speak to us all. We are not speaking strategy here. We're just talking information that can illuminate us, that can encourage us to stand up and to resist and to fight without end, without stopping our, I mean, fight without stopping our independence, our independence. So again, this is very, very critical that you hit your share button. Let us get this platform as populated uh, more than ever before, please. More than ever before. I do not want anybody to miss this because you will love it. Again, you will love it. And uh, as, I, as I said, in a few days, I will come to you with a very special presentation on the interview uh, published in La Republic du Cameroon by the Canadian High Commissioner in Yaoundé. We will talk about that with my panelists in the days to come. But what we will do today, I will bring you just this interview. And after the interview, I will open the phone lines for a few minutes just to uh, get your opinion on what uh, Professor Hussein and uh, I mean what Professor Hussein brings to us today. So please, ladies and gentlemen, without wasting time, without wasting time, please I urge you hit your share button, populate this platform, populate this platform. Let us make it. Uh, let us make sure that every Ambazonian, every Ambazonian is here and is watching and is listening. Ground Zero, I will take your questions. I will take your questions the moment. Even Diaspora, I will take your questions the moment this interview is over. And I'd like you to know, ladies and gentlemen, this interview uh, was recorded. This interview was recorded within the last... 20 minutes. Uh, that is one of the reasons why I, I'm coming to you quite late, because this interview was being recorded. So, 
Uh, I will now bring you the interview as you go ahead to continue to hit your share button, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks. Please enjoy. Thank you, Professor Hussein, for joining me here on the ABC Amber Television. It's a great pleasure to have you joining me all the way, all the way from out there in Somaliland. It's a wonderful privilege to have you share with us, the people of Ambazonia, the experiences you encountered uh, trying to restore, trying to restore the independence, the sovereignty of the people of Somaliland. Good, even, good evening, sir. It's a pleasure to have you. Good evening, Chris. Uh, it's my pleasure to be uh, to join you here and to talk about the uh, similarity as of, of Amazonia and Somaliland. But first, I will describe Somaliland and its history as well as its current status. Absolutely, I will appreciate that. But let me start with you, sir. Uh, I think uh, our audience would, would want to know a little bit about yourself. Who is Professor Hossein Ahan? Okay, Hossein Bulhan. Um, I am, well, I was trained in the United States, born, of course, in the region here. And um, I in the states i went to uh wesleyan university in middletown connecticut first then boston university and harvard later i became a professor at boston university my field is in mental health i was working in hospitals in the boston area later i got my tenure at boston university uh, which was certainly i worked for and i was pleased but at the time I was there, we were going through enormous struggle in Somaliland against the military dictatorship, and our people were have taken up arms to resist that dictatorship and to re restore their independence and freedom. So basically while there, both as a student and later as a young professor, we joined the struggle on human rights for freedom and so on and so forth. I was in the States. Later, we managed to get to, to, to restore the independence of Somaliland and we developed our own government. I came here uh, to help in the, in the process of rebuilding. So I've been here and uh, since then, I've done various things in terms of helping restore peace and also advance democratization in Somaliland. Uh, where we ended up, along with the support of many others, uh, in terms of getting a government that's democratic, we restored peace, and I'll talk more about what are the kinds of things we have done. But in essence, I am a person uh, who has been very much interested in the issues of social justice, wherever, wherever I can reach or work with people. So. I'm very pleased to discuss with you and to also share our experiences to people of Amazonia because there is a great deal of similarity with what we have gone through and what you're going through as well. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. So since returning, since returning to Somaliland, uh, what do you do out there? Are you one of the ministers? Are you, I know you go by the title of professor or are you a professor in the university or what precisely uh, do you do there? Well, I'm a doctor. I am a doctor who is working with issues of mental health, post-traumatic disorder, you know, as I came back. This was the area that I worked with, but also the whole issue of peace building. As I returned, I have been involved with various things. One of those, on the issues of rebuilding, those was uh, starting along with a friend of mine, uh, a think tank called Academy for Peace and Development at the beginning. I also developed a, a program in which youth who have lost 
their their education during the war could be could be helped in, in retain, re, regaining their their education. I was at the same time treating victims of trauma for uh, for all types of psychological psychiatric trauma that was there. Subsequently, because as part of rebuilding, you can't just do only one piece. Uh, where the whole country is in ruin uh, after the mines were cleared because the government that Somaliland people fought uh, when they left, when they were defeated basically and it was about to collapse, it mined, mined literally landmines of the city of Argesa where I live today and at the time, almost a year um, before I came, the mines were cleared there was only one street that was safe and people could live throughout the city and that those mines were created. It was such a cruel uh, behavior. The young children, frequently you heard news of mines that exploded on them, named some of them killed, adults who walked in uh, somewhere outside of that street. So I joined the process of rebuilding. I didn't stay only with my role as a professor. At the time, there was no universities at all, but helping others. But, and as a doctor, I also joined the, the, the process of rebuilding. Of course, involved that uh, at that time, when I came, there were only two companies. Both of them were the old-fashioned, you know, cable companies who were overcharging people $2.75 per minute. And uh, I really, I, I, I would call it, I was calling at night, uh, uh, offices were open in the States, and I frequently found poor people were sitting outside there in order to call relatives, in the hope that relatives abroad would call and send them some remittance. So I decided to start a competitive telephone company. I was never in telecommunication, it never occurred to me, but it I felt at that time it was necessary to, to start a, an alternative one. So I brought the first company in Maliland and uh, charged people maximum $1. They were charging $2.75 per minute. And we okay, charged uh, $1. Prof, $1. Prof uh, if you may hold on for a second, we're going to get back there. I'd like us to uh, do this in a very surgical way so that uh, the okay. audience really get uh, the history and uh, the step by step how you got where you are today. Now, I like us to I like you to Thank tell you. us where was Somaliland in 1960 when African countries began uh, getting independence? Where was Somaliland? Okay, let me begin with. Somalis have be, had the misfortune in the late 18th century, uh, sorry, 19th century, to, divide, to be divided by different colonial powers. Okay, Somaliland was a British, former British protectorate, they called it, it's a colony. Somalia was the former Italian colony. Then on the north of Somaliland, you had also Djibouti, which is a French, was the French on the west of Somaliland, another territory held by Ethiopians, they were called at that time Abyssinians, shared the loot at that time. On the south of uh, Somalia, certainly west of Somalia, Somalia, was Kenya, and there were Somalis. All in all, there were five Somali territories. Somaliland was one of them. Somaliland earned the earliest free independence in 1960, June, uh, June 26, 1960. Somalia ended later in 1960. So there was a, an attempt to unite. Hello? Do you hear me? Yeah. Oh, I, 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 I'm sorry, you were not hearing me. So, uh, no, if I got you right, no, no, no. did you say that Soma Somaliland held independence before Somalia? Yes, Somalia, two days, it was June 26th. Somalia earned four years later, July 1st. 
and so Somaliland, uh, if, let's get this right. Somaliland got independence in 1962. In 1960, yes. 1960. And Somalia, uh, in what year? Somaliland, let me repeat, earned independence in June 26, 1960. Four days later, Somalia and it is independence in 1960, July 1st, 1960. You understand what I mean? Yes. Uh, so that was a year no. apart, no. Uh, if I got you right? No, no, just, just days apart. Days apart. No, days apart, okay. Days. The Somaliland was recognized at that time since it earned its independence first, was recognized by over countries abroad, they recognized them as a sovereign state. Then it joined with Somalia. With the whole idea, remember, uh, well, this in 1960s, the mood in Africa was not only independent unity, to unite and unite, you know, as African people, there were the whole, the whole themes were unity. Somalia pressed for unity with Somalia as an independent state, when so became independent four years four, four days later, yes. he joined in unity with Somalia. So, uh, so, so, who pressed for independence or joining with who? Did Somalia say, hey, Somal Somal Somaliland, please uh, come, let's join, or Somaliland said, Somalia, let's join? Well, there were there were two different views in Somalia. One was the public view of uniting all Somalis. There was the, the other elite, the governing elite, political elite, who really were resistant to some degree in Somalia, but it had the pressure, you know, in Somalia as well. The biggest pressure also came in Somaliland public, who said we must and they pressed the Somaliland politicians to unite. And when they went to Mogadishu, they said to them, don't come back if you do not come with unity. Because the public mood was one of unity. And in Somalia, finally, they accepted and they joined. But unfortunately, the problems began with unity. Because with unity, Somaliland public so committed to, to unity and pressed their politicians who negotiated it, they accepted the capital city of Mogadishu, which is in Somalia. They asked the president of Somalia. They accepted the prime minister of Somalia. You remember, they accepted uh, a parliament that was not the majority, majority. They accepted majority parliament. They accepted everything literally for the sake of unity. They had this first and foremost on their own, but they basically thought, perhaps, maybe uh, idealistically, thought that unity was far better, unity of Africa. But unfortunately, their problems began a year later. A year later, there was the revolt began. Okay, uh, hold on there. Uh, what was the population of Somaliland and that of Somalia at this time of independence? In general, you could see, uh, there was Somalia would be, let's say, at least a third. Somalia okay. had relation, definitely. Uh, Somaliland is located, if you look at at a very strategic area close to the Red Sea, the Indian Ocean. Somalia is south of it, and the population is a little bit more. And the idea at the time was this idealism for unity. But very, very soon, very soon, there was uh, the problems began. So, if I may uh, ask you, what did Somaliland bring to the table in this uh, unity accord with Somalia that uh, would later uh, make them to withdraw from that accord? 
Well, first, Somaliland, in June, as I said, June 26, it, 1960, it earned its independence. It was celebrated and all of that. A day later, they wrote the parliament, the Somali parliament, wrote an of union, the terms of which were exactly the two countries their unity would entail. The Somaliland parliament delayed that year, a year later. You know, they did not, right? They didn't even argue on that. It was just kept somewhere. And a year later, they came up with their own act of union, which did not include the Somaliland members of the parliament. In their absence, they had debated and they came up with a union, union which was flawed. The Somaliland parliamentarians and elite rejected it. What did they bring to the union? Somaliland brought to the union, number one, it had already a government of its own. It was recognized and it also had a very good uh, civil servant, very good human resources, whereas in the Italian colony, it was rife with corruption and with didn't have very good educational system either. As for resources, we had certainly a very uh, strategic coast, and we were self-sustaining in comparison to it as well. So remember, these were African countries coming out uh, of, of colonial rule that were one way or another exploited, and they came up to begin rebuilding of their own states. So they didn't bring anything particular for Somalia then, and Somalia well was more or less the same. But this spirit of unity was driving it, and it soured and became a disappointment for people of Somalia. And that a year so how later, long, if, if, the rebellion. If, if, how long did you live together together with Somalia before eventually deciding to pull out? Twenty. Uh, it is almost about thirty years. So you almost were about thirty. Years. You were with Somalia for thirty years. Yes, you had you had for instance uh, initially when the two countries came in independent united started with civilian government, governments and parliamentary selected the prime minister and so on and so forth. But nine years later, the military coup took place. The military took over both Somaliland and Somalia, and the military was ruling for 21 years. 1991 is when it collapsed. And uh, the, the military rule, you know, at that time, 69, this whole rhetoric of revolution and change, corruption, equity, and so on and so forth. This is what they advised the people had hoped, both in Somalia and Somalia. Unfortunately, two years later, the tyranny of the military regime became obvious, imprisonment, gagging the population, Somalia, Somaliland. When and you said, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, when you say the military uh, took over, are you referring to the Soma, uh, Somalian military or Somaliland military? No, it, it is primarily military. There were, of course, military in Somaliland. Uh, in the military, there were members of the, of the military, were Somaliland military, but primarily it was Somalia. The dictator that came up the general, General Mohammed Siad, was from Somalia. He was an old colonial hand who has served previously, and, and he was the one who came up with the coup. And he's the one who, who continued from 1960 to 1991, okay? And of those who were his cronies, were it finally moved on into his own family and group that that related to him. But of course, others as well, but it was a dictatorship. Somaliland people, not only the, that started in 1961, after the independence, that moved on resentment for a long while. By 70, when the military took over, 69, they took over. By 1972, many of the Somali civilians had gradually sought employment elsewhere 
whether it is in Saudi Arabia or other Arab countries or, or uh, Europe, they left. What has happened is this, the reason is this, and this is what happens or in other situations, other countries. The capital city was run by Somalia, people of Somalia. The, it was run by people of Somalia. It became a dictator of cities by itself. Everything was there. People of let me Somalia, let me let me let me stop you there a little bit. When you join, yes, go ahead. Uh, when you join Somalia, what kind of government, what kind of government uh, was operated between the two? Was it uh, a central government, a federal government? And in the case of a federal government, what powers did Somaliland exercise in Good. that uh, system? Okay. Federal government at all. Uh, it was a central government based in Mogadishu initially as a coach. There was a prime minister that was the ones that selected them both. Well, the, they selected the president, the president selected the prime minister, the prime minister built his own cabinet. That was the system for nine years. This is an Italian system. This is the way the Italians has designed it. And uh, with Somaliland, they found that the unity they were seeking very quick to them. And the members of the cabinet members, they were fewer in number, they were fewer in parliament, primary level of power was, was held by Somalia, but people still while hoped to be changed and people would re recognize the injustice was there. When the military came, they came up with this rhetoric of unity, of equality, of social justice. But very quickly, it degenerated into a tyranny. And the tyranny, of course, some people of Somalia also suffered within the, with the military. Uh, and they actually called themselves as socialists. They were getting aid from the Soviet Union, former Soviet Union. And the military was built by them. And so people were gagged and repressed here, as well as people of Somalia, as well as Somalia. The resentment began with the Somaliland, who eventually took yeah, and, and, and fought the military regime, which brought about enormous disaster and resentment. People were, uh, uh, for instance, the city so, where I live now. Uh, so, so, so would you, would you say the desire for the so, uh, uh, for Somaliland to pull out was possibly more because of the military uh, invasion than of uh, uh, assimilation, marginalization, and uh, uh, discrimination? Well, it was actually certainly the military regime. Uh, created conditions for all people to resent the government. In Somaliland, as I said, a year later after Union, the rebellion began with military officers, for instance, like uh, the military officers who were from Somaliland and joined the Somali forces. They were trained in, in Britain. They were officers trained in Sanharist. They were People who were well trained, they came back and then they joined the Somali armed forces. The Somali arms did not exist. The Italians at that time did not train military officers, they only trained police. And the police, the new army that was for Somalia and Somaliland unity, the army comprised of these San Harris graduates as well as policemen, including. Dictator, they were given higher ranks, generals and whatever. And these young officers trained in San Harris, seeing the inequity in the military that was similar, inequity in the civil service and others revolted. So it did not begin beginning with the military, but the military actually expanded and made it intense. Okay. What is the population of Somaliland today? 
today is about four million. About four million. Now let's get back to the to your uh, moment of independence and the time that you pull out of Somalia. Uh, you have stated that your colonial masters uh, were the British. What role right. or what kind of support did you receive or have you received from the British uh, from the time that you set out uh, pulling out of Somalia? What kind of support did you get uh, from the British, if any? Okay, the British actually, here is a little bit history, the British colonial power as so people of Somaliland agitated for not only independence but unity with Somalis, with Somalis, the British had said, stay out, remain independent, we will help you develop and uh, at least give time for, for you to stand on your own feet and we will help you develop. Uh, and some people of Somaliland refused. They pushed for unity. But that unity was not a unity just with the desire to unite with Somalia, but also with the French uh, to unite with people in Ethiopia, Somalis in Ethiopia, to unite with Somalis with Kenya. There was this theme at that time of pan-Somali unity. That was the greater, it was not just a desire to unite with Somalia, but with other Somalis. Now, the Somalia also had the same, at least the public had the same goal. This idea with Somali, Somalia and Somali, Somaliland uniting, there was this greater hope of pan-Somali unity. But that of course would bring these two United countries or states, again as neighboring countries. First, the French government that was ruling Djibouti with Ethiopia, that was ruling the eastern part of some, the Somali territory there, and it also brought conflict with to the, the Kenya became independent, ruling the north east of Kenya where Somalis live. That was the spirit in which people bore inequity, hoping that there would be a bigger, larger freedom and equity would come about. But that delay delayed, and by 1977-78, there was war with Ethiopia. The military were running it. The military actually took on the military uh, sort of invasion as a way of redirecting, or, you know, uh, uh, deflecting the crisis inside by instigating war with Ethiopia. And that war had a larger participation. States, other countries were involved, and in the end, the Soviet Union that trained the Somali armed forces changed sides and joined with Ethiopia, and they brought Cuban soldiers to fight against that. So that that's what has happened. Following that defeat, uh, the, the, the conflict within Somalia and Somaliland intensified, uh, and Somaliland finally the, the, the uh, people of Somaliland, officers as well as others, have taken up arms to fight the military regime. From 19, 1979, it continued formally declaration of Somali national movement in 1981 abroad. Then they started regrouping other also resistance movements in Somalia as well against the military regime. So it took a while. That resistance cost Somalis, so many people of Somalia, enormously because the, the, the military regime, in revenge, you know, bombarded the city of Argeisa, where I live now, bombarded to the ground. There were planes that were flying from an airport just close by, about several miles away, and strafing the sea. The population, the survivors, who left, civilian survivors who left, were straved all the way to the Ethiopian border. Majority of those became refugees. And there was the population still, I mean, there was a fight, there was a war going on, but the population moved on. And it continued the war that was focused, the military war, 
that was focused on the people of Somaliland later expanded in Somalia as well because of the resent, uh, resentment and resistance began until the military collapsed completely. At that point, Somalia had military forces coming from the UN to keep peace, whereas Somaliland developed its own means. So, uh, 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 Doctor, if I'm, I ask the question of uh, the British, because uh, you have now uh, declared or restored your independence for about 30 years or since, since 1991, correct? Yes. Now, yes. what, uh, what mm -hmm. is stopping the British from then recognizing the sovereignty of Somaliland, having advised you from the onset not to join Somalia? Yes. So, uh, the onset was they advised not to join Somalia, which our people decided to join. Then there was a conflict between, you see, Somalia and Somaliland, when they united, they were both called so Republic. You understand? So, not Somalia Republic, not Somaliland Republic, Somali Republic. The conflict of the, with the British began when there was agitation in Kenya, is in Kenya, and that agitation led the Somali Republic, remember, which is which was formed of Somaliland and Somalia, kicked out the bridge, angered, angered by the way they dealt with it because there was a plebiscite. The people in that region voted to join Somalia in the Republic. And that angered uh, and and the British used to allow them to join, so they kept them with Kenya. That anger had brought uh, diplomatic relationships between Somalia and Somalia and and the British. That continued for a while. And 19, Somalia became independent. Britain was also part of the EU, and decisions were being made around issues of recognition and all that. They conceded more to to, to, to the EU's decision, not recognize Somalia. Uh, but the British, you know, to some extent, they have been helping. Uh, they were not uh, too much. Uh, nonetheless, it was quite little, very little. All right. So, uh, it appears we are having little issues with your uh, connection over there. I hope that uh, is manageable as we move on. But uh, is it you have uh, since uh, regained your sovereignty uh, again since 1991. Uh, right. If you can briefly, briefly explain how this started. For how long did you have to fight with uh, Somalia to regain your territory? Because I know right now you control all of your territory. You've done so for 30 years. You have your educational yes. system. You have your banks. You have a government in which elections have yes. been conducted quite, uh, I think about three times you mentioned uh, in the previous meeting. Uh, we want to know precisely, did the, uh, did Somalia just take, took, uh, they just took up and leave, or how did, did they not resist Somaliland they were, from controlling that territory? Yes. How did it happen? Did they just leave? Uh, as I said, in the military, there was a war with the military. In Somaliland, they took some people of Somaliland took up arms against the military regime. There was also other other movements that, that fought in within Somalia for different reasons, in terms of competition for power and, and seek for social justice. There was a war in nineteen. 1981, people of Somaliland took up arms. They fought all the way to 1991. And the military did everything to destroy the country, but 1991, the military collapsed itself. They were pushed out of Somaliland. 
they were also having problems in Somalia, and eventually it collapsed. From that point, Somalia got caught up with its own turmoil and conflict that, as you may know, has the UN military force to, to, to come up to save people of Somalia and the world. There were starvations, there were problems, where Somaliland was busy in its own rebuild of government. There was, there was not as much of the starvation, as much of the violence that the world has seen in Somalia. There was literally, you know, disaster within Somalia that, uh, that, that uh, brought all types of aid, military as well as other ones. Somalia, the unity to Somalia, uh, well, they, they, anyway, the military were, uh, they were themselves. There were conflicts, regions within clans, and so on and so forth. And it's still going to stay. To this day, 30 years later, Somalia is not standing on its own. There were successive military peacekeeping forces. First, there were the United, United Nations peacekeeping forces. Peace to From you, I know that Somaliland has achieved quite a feat in what it has done, having taken over the territory from uh, Somalia. You now have a school system, you have your own banking system, you have your own uh, legal system, everything, everything. In fact, everything is managed by your government that has been in place now for 30 years. For 30 years. What happened to the educational system in Somaliland during the 10 years period that you fought with uh, Somalia? Okay, uh, Chris, I want to really emphasize that uh, the struggle against dictatorship and the struggle for freedom was very bloody, cost a lot of human lives, and material destruction and so on and so forth. I want to emphasize when the military collapsed and Somaliland became free, it took a long while to actually restore peace and order because the country was in ruins and the arms were awash. Youngsters who had no really, their schools lost, they had no other, they had no jobs, were using guns that were pervasive in the country. They were, uh, they controlled the streets between cities and within cities as well. A time had to be really, a time, it took a while to bring order. The first government that was formed in, 19, in May 18, 1991, its term was only for two years. And those two years were of chaos and, and real problems. 1993 was the time people came together and formed a new government, starting with scratch, I must say, literally. Because even during peacetime, there was no one university in Somalia, one university. All, everybody had to go to Mogadishu. If you wanted a passport, you had to go to Mogadishu. If you wanted a scholarship, you had to go to Mogadishu. If you wanted hospital care, you know, medical care, uh, referral laws, you had to go to Mogadishu, literally. So now, with the collapse, it was even worse. Somaliland then, from 1993, began to disarm those youth and hooligans and others and bring peace, as I mentioned to you in that conference. People came together. Those clans, groups that had arms had to bring it back to to uh, to, to the you know, forming armies were created from there. It took a while to actually build those things. Today, if you if you come to Somaliland, you would think there was no war at all. It was all in peace. It is all in peace. You can travel anywhere, anytime, 24 hours in the country. You don't see guns. Uh, it took a while to develop that. Uh, we do have. We didn't have college 
in Somaliland for instance for how long? university for, for how oh. long well what I, the first one started in 1998 1998 you, see, you are saying the first people, college the first college in Somaliland first, started in 1998 you see people came back uh, from the war 1991 it took about seven eight years to develop the first one high school secondary school others were being built uh, and uh, it took it took a while now what you have is well over 30 universities in the country in different wow. parts of the province in different places uh, our university france fano is one of those there was Talmud university there's Hargeisa university there's Golish university there are universities all over the place in the provinces. Education has developed. We have a banking system. We have our own currency. And I wish at some point I, I could take you, show you walking in the streets in Hargeisa where money is being exchanged openly, openly. You know, people sitting on the street with cash, you know, just laid out, making currency exchange. You want Deutsche Mark, you want pound, you want American dollars, you want any, they will make change. There's not one person get, carrying a gun, not one person. In the marketplace, you know. What, they, it, what, they what, is, uh, your, what is your currency and what is the exchange rate per dollar? It is Somaliland currency and like Somalia and some part of the area, we use shillings, what's called shillings. And we have our own different currencies and, uh, and, and typically the currencies are in, in thousands, you know, say one dollar would be something like eight thousand five hundred. One dollar yeah. would be, no, eight thousand five hundred. So often the money is in large numbers, but there are pounds and there, there are currencies that are there. Now, so I, also, I understand, I understand, Prof, that you also have uh, your national passports. However, you don't have yeah, any well, international, uh, you don't have international flights uh, coming into Somali land. How do your people travel yes. with those passports? Well, at the very beginning, when uh, Somali land started uh, building from the ruins, there were diaspora persons who started, a, you know, an airplane. It began with a Cessna airplane. You know, just to take you from here to Djibouti, from here to Ethiopia, and that kind of thing. Later, they they developed, they got uh, better planes. Now, Ethiopian Airlines flies in here. Uh, Dubai and Fly Dubai flies in here. Air Arabia flies in here. So there are different planes. Now we we can travel anywhere. Our passports are recognized in some. We, we don't have recognition politically, but it is in Ethiopia. People can travel with Somali. Passport. They can travel to Djibouti. They can travel to Kenya. They can travel to UK. They can travel to uh, Turkey. We're not recognized, but recognition. You see, Somalia has recognition because it is granted to it. And I'll talk about that a little bit because because the existing governments, well, let's say African Union. African Union is, is, is more about recognizing states than human rights. African, they, 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 stat, they keep the status quo. And Somalia, which doesn't have, when it, it didn't even have government, it was recognized. Today it is recognized. Somaliland is not because they make the assumption that Somaliland is violating African unity, uh, you know, uh, colonial borders. African it's Union Charter. Yeah, there's, there's the whole idea that colonial, I think it's very similar also with, with Amazonia. There is this agreement made earlier with the Organization of African Unity that colonial borders should be kept as they are. Sanctity of colonial borders was the idea. But so it's good, like it's good you raise that point. Because didn't Somaliland have its own independent borders? So if the African exactly. Union argues that exactly. colonial exactly. borders should be maintained as they were, exactly. didn't Somaliland have exactly. colonial borders yes, before unity with Somalia? Of course. 
It had, it not only did it have colonial borders, there was an agreement of the British when they occupied it with Ethiopia. There was an agreement with the French who, col who, who, who uh, colonized Djibouti in terms of the borders, demarcation of the borders. There was also an agreement with the Italians. Uh, and, and we, the land we, we control now is the land that was independent, recognized by 35 Af when African Union majority of it does not even listen to that. They just say, no, 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 you're breaking up an African country. They don't listen. And I think that's the kind of thing you will be also facing because their interest, unfortunately, is an interest to maintain the status quo. And they do not want to listen to legality, to reason. They just want to say, no, 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 no. There was one time there was a commissioner, uh, uh, commissions that were sent by the African Union. They said this is clearly absurd. Somaliland is an independent country. It is also not part of the colonial borders that we have agreed not to dis, uh, dismantle. It was dismantled. It was a very different country. It's the same thing as Senegal and Gambia that united right. at one point, and they departed. Egypt and Syria. Uh, these things have happened in the past. Why not Somaliland? The reason is Somaliland has become an independent of its own. You see, it is the Europeans and the United States that determine Africans our leaders are just looking for a way a nod from them. Yes, let Somali Lam go. Then they will let us go. But we have right, talked right. and talked and Africans they're not doing it. And Amazonia, I think what you will be running into, as we have, is you know, you're struggling for your independence. If you do attain it, and in our case it was with a war that we attained it, the, you, you face a number of problems. Your own country, the people from your own population will not be as you know, united and, and in peace because arms, you fight for a while, there are lots of people who suffer trauma, lots of people who are carrying guns, Lots of people who have been lived in, who have been living in a state of, of of chaos. When they come back together, really demobilizing them, uh, getting the arms, you know, collected, uh, healing the trauma victims, providing certain kinds of you know basic needs. This is a struggle. Later, developing a government. I remember the elite, even those who fought. Uh, will be competing for power. And how do you sort of settle these uh, competition for power in a peaceful way? It took us a while. Uh, 1993 was the beginning. 1994, there was a conflict within us. That is when I also came here uh, to, to help in the peace, the rebuilding of the peace, and others also joined. The role of the diaspora is also very important very important that is a very good point that was the next point i was going to get to so tell us the rule of the diaspora in the somaliland struggle the role of the diaspora in somaliland struggle was this at the very beginning when they the war began with the military regime there were two lines of action primarily from the standpoint of action one was those who went in and joined the struggle they joined in there, in the land. But many of us remained wherever we were. However, we were actively organized against the military regime. I was in the States at that time. We had periodic times in which we demonstrated in Washington, in New York, but equally important, writing letters in media, talking to at universities, about the plight of Somaliland and the people. We had managed to get information and pictures from the ground, uh, what was being done by the military, strafing them or fighting in, and, and killing civilians, documents. And so. In addition though, what we did was we learned how to, for, I mean, the States fortunately is free for people to express their views to organize as long as you're not acting violently within, within the states. And so what we did was we organized ourselves that each Somalilander 
who was in a given state would organize with others in that state to campaign and lobby the senators of that state and the you know representatives we even managed to get hearings with the with 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 the uh, foreign relations of the of the senate uh, to present the, our plight we managed to get the african you know uh, you know house house there was an africa uh, section so what i'm saying is we we campaign at that time in the 80s the reagan bush were supporting the military regime in somalia they were giving arms to the because they alienated themselves from the soviet union and the united states was supporting them we were against that and we managed to publicize the plight of somaliland to the point that we managed to get support from uh, support for amnesty international uh, human rights you know other organizations and eventually we managed to cut arms from the military regime which was another thing they lost the flow of arms that were coming we managed to get for instance in my case uh, well we had we had a journal called horror horn of africa journal which publicized some of these issues but we took it not only in somaliland alone for horn of africa journal we made it in the region for ethiopia for somalia for uh, sudan all of them were being run by dictators so we rallied with the ethiopians who were against the military dictator mangisu haile maria we rallied with the sudanese who were against uh, at that time uh, one one dictator they had and we also presented our case eventually we managed to cut funds and 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 arms from the military regime which weakened it so that people who took up arms in the ground were able to to do something so the diaspora can play a role more important also and equally important was was uh, remittance yes we were sending money to our relatives and that's very important we we the flow of money to support the survivors but also the struggle was very important writing media whatever we could use eventually when somaliland became independent it was now a question of not just sitting back because we found out we, we thought that independence once we got it that's it let the uh, people in the ground run it but we found out they were not able to run it until we had also to come in i was one of those who came in and gave up my job as tenured professor a company i had uh, that was doing very well with offices in washington dc in virginia in arkansas in oregon you know we had offices a consulting firm i left it i came here because i thought this was this was a commitment i must make when i'm young and healthy to help at the time i was needed but i'm so, not the only one this is what happened with many right now uh during the fighting against somalia how many military factions did you have in the land in somaliland or was there just one component of the military fighting or different people let me put it this way different warlords or different groups control different did that happen different military uh, groups did that was well, that the case there were, some, there were some factions some of course that even even the somali somaliland who worked with the government or the military government you know uh, but the primary one was somali national movement there was one primary one that fought against the military regime within it there were conflicts there were conflicts in which people were pushing one way let's do this or that way or competition for personal power right right fortunately what has happened over the period of time uh, is that whenever there was a, this kind of conflict people would sit sit down and talk about it until the, it is settled they would not rush and say let's put one group against another always looking for some form of consensus okay we're not able to settle the issue now let's wait and see let's talk let's talk for somalia had that fortune of not really taking up arms against each other but trying to solve even when they were fighting on the field right the, that was the hard 
chairmen of the movement were often changed politically and through discussion, not militarily. You Did see, you have different, different? Uh, I mean, these these different military groups. Did you also have different political leanings uh, on the ground? And if so, how was the collaboration, if any, uh, among these okay. different factions? The, we did have militants who have left the government some time ago and joined the movement. Okay, They themselves had competition within themselves, you understand, for who is going to be the top dog and all that kind of typical dynamic that is there. But the majority of the arms were carried, you know, by the by by the civilians. You know, they were they were important, but they were not such that they controlled factions as such. They were wow. within the, the, the presence of the civilians. Many civilians, by the way, who came back even from abroad had joined and got trained as guerrilla fighters. So there came a point in which a military officer would find other civilians who have been trained in war, and they were themselves in their own right, military officers of sorts. So 